All right. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or evening, depending on where you're uh, logging in from. We already have a nice audience tuned in, so it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our second EP Africa Knowledge Week session called Expanding Productive Use uh, Lessons from the Field. Uh, we started yesterday with a webinar on uh, climate resilience, where we published our brand new study, um, Energizing Resilience. Uh, we will finalize the Knowledge Week tomorrow in our 10-year uh, anniversary session, but I will tell you a bit more about that later. My name is Lotta Wilkman. I'm one of the four EP Africa portfolio coordinators, and I'm based in Helsinki, Finland. Our second moderator today is my colleague Faith Chege Shuli from Nairobi, and she will step in to lead the panel discussion. Uh, just the usual housekeeping items, uh, you will stay unmuted during the session and if you have questions or comments to our speakers, uh, please submit them using the chat box that can be found in the panel at the uh, right side of your screen. Uh, there you will also access the handouts, uh, the EP reports that we will be speaking about. And then we have reserved time for uh, Q&A at the end of the session, but we will be aggregating questions along the way. So feel free to uh, enter them in the chat box. Uh, we will try to get through as many as possible, uh, depending on the time available at the end. Uh, we will also have a couple of polls during the discussion. So everyone in the audience will have a chance to uh, participate and use their voice, and hopefully we'll get some interesting results. So we will practice the poll function now by asking you to tell uh, which part of the world you are calling in from. So it only takes a couple of seconds to click the right button. Uh, we can wait a bit more if someone is just now filling their coffee cup. Um, yeah, and I will be spending the next couple of minutes providing some background for this discussion. And I will first briefly introduce uh, EP Africa and then guide you to the topic of the day by sharing some uh, fresh insights from the EP Africa uh, 2020 market report. And after that, Faith will welcome our guest speakers, uh, representing five different EEP grantee companies, who will bring their lessons from the field and talk about their experiences um, entering and, and expanding the productive use market in Africa. So we can maybe get the results from the first poll. Um, okay, so uh, Europe and East Africa, uh, are leading uh, in the audience, but uh, welcome everyone from, from Africa, Europe and, and other parts of the world. I, I hope you will enjoy the, the next 90 minutes and, and of course learn and get some new ideas. So I believe a, a great majority of our audience is already uh, familiar with EP Africa and what we're doing. But for those who are not, I will just go through a, a couple of uh, quick facts on EP. Uh, today, EP Africa is a multi-donor trust fund managed by the Nordic Development Fund, NDF. And currently the funding comes from three sources, NDF and two other donors, uh, Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Austrian Development Agency. And EP's main purpose is to provide early stage grant financing to innovative clean energy projects. And um, through our more recent EEP Catalyst window, we also offer um, flexible follow-on debt financing to um, successful uh, earlier EEP grantees. The focus area is Southern and East Africa, and we support projects in, in 15 different countries. And NDF and, and most of our team is based here in, in Helsinki, Finland, but we have portfolio coordinators in Nairobi and also in Harare, Zimbabwe. Uh, in addition to the financing, EP also offers uh, investment facilitation and business development support services to our uh, project developers. Uh, for example, we organize an annual matchmaking event called the EP Investor Forum, and we also provide support in capacity building and, and financial management, etc. And the third um, sort of pillar of EP is uh, knowledge, policy and partnerships. We organize knowledge exchange events um, this year, obviously virtually, uh, and produce uh, studies, thematic briefs, case studies, and, and market analysis uh, based on the data from our um, wide portfolio. 
Uh, so our portfolio is very diverse and we have amazing project developers uh, representing 10 or even more different clean energy technologies and a variety of uh, business models from cookstove distribution to larger on-grid hydropower plants and, and everything in between. The project types uh, range from feasibility studies to piloting and, and demonstrating new products or solutions and all the way up to scale up and, and replication. So this year we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of EP Africa and through these years we have provided financing to over 250 projects. The active portfolio size is about 45 projects and we're just now um, in the middle of contracting uh, another 25 or so projects. So if you visit our website or, or even better, if you join our uh, closing Knowledge Week uh, session tomorrow, you will learn more about the highlights in our journey and, uh, and our achievements towards uh, the SDGs and, and energy access in Africa. So um, next, I'm going to guide you towards the, the topic of, of the day, productive use of energy, by presenting some of the key findings from our uh, market report, which is hot off the press and, and published today. And you can also access it directly from the handout section in, the, uh, in your screen. The report is based on data collected from our latest call for proposals uh, and our annual survey. It's a very uh, concise snapshot on the, on the observations around the clean energy market in the region. And it also provides um, several interesting project highlights from our portfolio uh, demonstrating the development in action. So this year, um, 2020, uh, will of course be remembered as a as a strange turning point in, in in the history, and many EP project developers have been uh, hit hard by the COVID nineteen impacts. So that has been at the core of everything. But apart from that, in in twenty twenty, EP Africa has been witnessing the the evolution of productive use of energy and the increasing role of clean energy in circular economy. So in February this year, uh, EP Africa launched a call for proposals with the theme Clean Energy Powering Green Growth. The call attracted uh, 350 applications that covered agricultural processing, waste energy, solar irrigation, different kinds of cold chain solutions, light manufacturing, e-mobility technologies, and of course, um, mini grids with different kinds of uh, integrated uh, productive use of energy solutions. Uh, over half of the productive use proposals were related to agricultural value chains and this was actually also discussed in our uh, session yesterday and it's clear that um, clean energy plays a, a very critical role in developing uh, sustainable and climate resilient ways of uh, food production. So the proposed uh, agric agricultural solutions range from uh, small egg incubators uh, to small scale processing and cold storage and, uh, and larger industrial scale meals. And what was also interesting uh, was the relatively high number of companies uh, developing clean energy solutions for uh, municipal institutions such as schools or health clinics. And even though it was not a, a theme or a requirement in this call, we were very happy to see that uh, women-led companies and local companies were well represented. And again, uh, more statistics on, on geographical spread of the applications, uh, et cetera, can be uh, found in the, in the report. So we could see the, the quality and range of clean energy appliances is is very uh, rapidly growing, but one of the biggest challenges is, is still market entry. So in order to successfully enter a new market with a new product, the projects need to focus on uh, awareness raising activities and also uh, develop new kinds of uh, payment schemes that to, to defer the, the full cost of the productive use appliances. 
and for example, pay-as-you-go systems that have uh, traditionally been seen in uh, in solar home system markets are now being uh, integrated to new kinds of solutions. And then uh, the other emphasis in our call besides productive use of energy was circular economy. Um, the market is still young in Africa, but we noticed that in countries that already have a um, vibrant clean energy market, uh, like in South Africa or Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Uganda, the, the companies are more ready to integrate uh, circular economy solutions to their business models. And most of the projects seen in this call were uh, waste your energy projects, uh, especially biomass and, and biogas. And while the um, feedstock sources, um, like different types of agricultural waste, are not necessarily uh, new, the innovation um, we noticed was in the business models. For example, um, targeting institutional clients, uh, introducing new financing schemes like pay as you go, or establishing uh, public-private partnerships. And the, um, the well-known challenge for off-grid electricity sector in general is uh, e-waste management, which um, needs to be addressed soon before um, we know that thousands and thousands of uh, solar home systems that have been sold to African households in the past years uh, come to the end of their life cycle. And there are efforts, efforts to recycle e-waste in Africa and, um, and they are gaining ground, but so far they have been limited first uh, by a lack of consumer awareness, but also due to uneven regulation and low capacity. Uh, then uh, one observation from our 2020 call was also the rapid rise of e-mobility projects. And uh, this is probably gaining speed from larger efforts of donors and African governments to promote uh, sustainable transport in Africa. The EP, uh, the e-mobility applications from uh, for EP funding focused on uh, different types of vehicles like motorcycle taxis, uh, three-wheelers, cars, um, four by four off-road vehicles, and even um, electric motors for fishing boats. And one of our active portfolio companies called Zembo is pioneering in the motorcycle taxi market in Uganda. And they have established um, a network of electric taxis or uh, boda bodas and solar charging stations. And we actually wanted to invite Zembo to this session to share their experiences in e-mobility uh, but unfortunately, they were not able to join at this time. Um, but I recommend that you you take um, take a look at this uh, excellent Zembo case study and read the story of this uh, uh, of this uh, uh, EP grantee uh, exploring the e-mobility in in Africa. Uh, then, last thing uh, before handing over to Faith and our panelists, I will take the opportunity to to also promote our other index study on productive use, which was uh, published uh, late last year. And, and this really highlights the, the evolution in productive use business models, and also presents um, a selection of very interesting case studies from the EV Africa portfolio. So um, now I will give the virtual floor to my colleague Faith and our guest speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Lotta. As uh, Lotta mentioned, my name is Faith Chege. I'm a portfolio coordinator at EP Africa, based in Nairobi, Kenya, and I'll be moderating the next part of the session where we will be hearing from five of our portfolio companies that are providing a range of uh, productive appliances in Eastern Southern Africa. And we'll start off with introductions. And uh, here we'll hear what our speakers are doing, what productive user appliances they're providing, and they'll provide a bit of color on how innovative the business models are and uh, the countries they're operating in. And then after this session, we'll move to just dig deeper into the lessons that they've been learning in the field over their last days of operation. So we'll start off with Laura from Power Me. Uh, over to you, Laura, to introduce yourself. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you, First Faith and, and Lotta, for including us uh, in this knowledge event. Um, my name is Laura Sundblad. I work in Nairobi for PowerMe, 
PowerMe is a solar home system distributor. We sell solar home systems on a pay-as-you-go basis to rural and peri-urban families, mainly in Western Kenya, where we operate in 14 counties. We've been operating here in Kenya since 2016, and we've reached over 22,000 households in that time. And so PowerMe is, is a little bit different than, than solar home system companies that you might know in that we are supplier agnostic and so vertically disintegrated. So we choose products from suppliers that are able to suit the needs of our customers and then we match that with software also from different providers. And so we have been focusing on the smaller end of the solar home system market up to date. But in 2019, we were fortunate to be selected as an EEP portfolio company under the gender-themed call for proposals, where we applied with a project called Pawa to the Shamba Mamas, so Shamba being a farm. And so we are now looking at introducing um, a range of productive use appliances that are solar powered and pay-as-you-go enabled to our customer base, starting with women farmers who uh, represents a significant portion of our customers in the field. And so this year we've been preparing, planning, hiring, sourcing, getting ready for our first productive use um, launch, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, in the next sort of segment. Um, but what we see here in Kenya in particular, where the pay-as-you-go market is quite, uh, quite vibrant and there's a lot of things uh, being able to distribute these assets will enhance our, our customers and it'll enhance us, it'll help us increase our reach. Um, so thanks again for, for including us and um, I look forward to the to the deeper conversation on solar powered productive use. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we'll now hear from Sharon. Uh, tell us a bit about Power Life. Hi, Faith. Hey, thank you for having me on this platform and enabling me to talk a bit about Power Life Zimbabwe. Now, my name is Sharon Yeti and I am the CEO of Power Life Zimbabwe. We started operations in 2018 and uh, we've been mostly focusing on selling scalable solar energy systems for home use and business energy business use as well. And since we got into the contract with EEP this year, we are mostly going to be focusing on uh, product, solar energy systems for productive use. Now, let me talk a little bit about Power Life Zimbabwe. We are a women's social enterprise. And like I've said, we are going to be focusing on selling scalable productive energy assets to rural and off-grid communities in Zimbabwe. And we mostly achieve this through rural women social groups that we engage with that are, that are in the rural areas. And now let me say that 85% uh, of our sales agents that are on the ground right now are mostly women. Our business model is centered on women being the major players in the household productivity and livelihood. Now, this is informed by our understanding of the roles that women play in the African communities. And as a woman, I can also relate that I understand what happens. Our idea of women empowerment is to increase the participation of women in the value chain process, because we believe that women are mostly affected by energy poverty. Now, we offer solar energy systems that power different appliances like TVs, we have solar water pumps, we have hair clippers, we have maize shillers and peanut butter making machines. And like I've mentioned before, our target market is the rural and off-grid communities and the small-scale farmers. Now, I believe that through the use of productive energy use, the benefits that our customers get are 
income generation. I want to talk about one client of ours that initially used to sell groundnuts as a way of getting income. And then with the onset of peanut butter making, now she says she's making a bit more income than she used to initially, and she's really excited about it. And we also have one who's into tailoring or dressmaking. Now, with the onset of COVID-19, there's a high demand for masks. And she's been saying that she's been getting a lot of orders. And now with now that she has lighting in her home, she's able to work throughout the night, which is very good for her because she's able to meet the demand that she's getting. And I also think that with solar water pumps, they enable some of our small scale farmers to be more resilient to variable climate conditions by enabling production of the different crops, which also means there's more employment and there's more income for these customers of ours. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. I'll now invite Priscilla to introduce uh, Wala. Might be on there. Yes, I've been muted. Yeah, so my name is Priscilla um, Jimwele, and I am the founder and chief executive at Wala Limited in Lilongwe, um, Malawi, is where we're operating out of. Um, and we first registered as a business in 2016. Um, and at the time, our interest was in providing broad um, off grid solutions to low income populations but we quickly came across a challenge where these populations were having a hard time affording the equipment um, and that is because the the majority of our population in in rural areas that are off grid are they don't have any kind of sustainable income they are unemployed um, so if you just go and you sell them um, for instance solar home systems or bulbs then you sort of put the burden of um, income on them to see where they're going to get the income to to afford the equipment to be able to pay for that equipment so based on that challenge uh, we started talking to stakeholders and after a couple of iterations we did a pivot where um, it was clear that the the best solution was productive use because what productive use does is it helps the the user um, generate the income that they need to be able to afford the equipment to be able to pay for the equipment um, and in a country like malawi where about 90 percent percent um, depending on on whose statistics you use um, so between 90 85 percent of the population are off grid but also definitely over 80 percent of our population are in rural areas focusing on agriculture the productive use technology that made the most sense um, was linking off-grid renewable energy technologies to agriculture and when you're looking at agriculture, then the first entry point for us was in irrigation because uh, everybody has access to land. Um, even if they do not own it, they have access to land in their area and they can rent land and be able to grow something, even if it's just one acre. So what we, we challenged ourselves to do was basically help them monetize that piece of land, even if it's one acre. Um, if you're suddenly growing crops only three times a year, then you're tripling your income at minimum. And if you grow high value crops, then um, you're multiplying your, what would have been your income from the one rainy season four, five, six times um, in some cases. So that's how we basically came to our focus on productive use technologies for agriculture. But our mission generally is productive use. And where we'd be going um, in, two or so years would be value addition. So productive use technologies, uh, off-grid solutions, solar powered solutions for value addition. But at the moment, what we're piloting um, with the funding and support from EEP is smallholder solar powered irrigation systems. And what, what we have done then is we, one of the, the stakeholders, the major stakeholders that we engaged in this process of iteration was the Minister of Agriculture and other stakeholders that are active in the sector. Uh, and we found that there's actually a lot of organized farmer groups, a lot of organized farmer clubs that were looking for solar powered irrigation equipment but had no idea where to get it. And the, the ministry and other stakeholders then helped us compile a list and we're currently sitting on 800 organized pharma clubs across the country that have indicated to one of the partners that we 
reached out to at some point or other that they would like um, us, they would like access to solar powered irrigation systems. But at the same time, the, the realization has been that this is relatively new technology. And again, if we just go and sell it to these groupings without providing them the services that they need to, to maximize that equipment, then we're, we, we risk falling back to the same challenge that they have this equipment, they don't know how to use it, they're not generating the kind of income that they need to generate from it. So what we have done um, beyond just selling the equipment to the farmers beyond, so based on this list, uh, we have shortlisted and we have a group of farmers that we're starting with and what we're going to be doing then with the farmers is also providing support services around the equipment so we sell the equipment to them but more than that we we move with them throughout the season um, so the the services that we're providing around that would be the first one that the farmers get to pay for the equipment slowly over a period of time and uh, you know in in regular solar language there's the term pay as you go um, but what we're calling this is pay as you grow so they grow their their crop and at the end of the harvest season when they have sold it to market that is when they are able to make payments so anticipate that three um, payments should be coming out within a year so two irrigation based and one rain fed season um, and we also have financial partners um, that we we have identified so this would be the typical example of the two that we have agreements with currently are uh, finance cooperatives. And the advantage of that is that how a FinCorp works is by opening an account, you become a member, you become a shareholder. So as you're saving, you're actually generating your own dividends. And we thought that that was better than um, helping them access loans at a bank. And the reason why we needed a financial partner was because we are giving the farmers opportunity to pay for the equipment over a period of time. And we need to have some kind of basis to identify who are credit worthy. Um, so they open accounts, they start saving, and through that we can see who saves when they're supposed to, um, who withdraws when they're supposed to. If they take a loan, are they paying it back when they're supposed to? So that gives us a risk profile as well, where we can say, okay, we're able to loan the equipment to these farmers because their relationship with money is relatively healthy. The other service that we're providing is capacity buildings and trainings. And the, the three that we're doing um, is good agricultural practice. So we are training our farmers in, in good agricultural practice because we want them to, like I said, make the most use of the equipment as possible. And if we just give it to them and they're using the same old practices, which are not high efficiency, then the equipment is not going to be as efficient as it should be. And the other training would be from a business schools because the idea is that the farmers start thinking of farming as a business. So traditionally it's been, if they have say one acre or one acre, one hectare rather, then the farming there is literally just for sustenance, just for subsistence. But we want them to think of it as a business because they have taken a loan to pay for the equipment and we want them to get their produce to market and generate additional income. So we're training them as well in how to do farming as a business. And the third one is how to operate and maintain solar technology because it's, it's relatively new equipment and technologies to them. And finally, um, what we're doing is also linking them to markets. So throughout the season, at the beginning of the season, we identify what area they're working in, um, what crops would perform best in that area. And we help them, as I said, throughout the season to grow these crops, uh, provide training, we're doing monitoring visits, making sure that they're using the equipment as they're supposed to, they are not spoiling it, they're not using it, I don't know, to sled or whatever that they're using it for that's supposed to and it's not getting ruined. And at the end of that, though, we want them to be able to access markets and sell whatever crop they have grown at the best possible price. So at the beginning, um, the crops that they, they grow, the crops that we agree they grow on are based on markets that we have already helped them identify. And what that does is it minimizes the risk in terms of they don't end up with crops that they don't have anywhere to sell. But for us as well, what that does is it gives us the off taker who when the farmers sell the equipment to the off taker, the off taker pays the finance cooperative and that finance cooperative is the one that then pays us for whatever there we are owed for that season by the farmers and this minimizes the risk of the farmers touching the money and then forgetting that they have to pay us uh, you know when the money is in your hands um, it's a different story but if the money comes to them and whatever they owe for that season has already been deducted then it minimizes the risk all around so okay. um, in a nutshell that that is well and what is what we're doing all right thank you so much I'll from uh, VIP Thank you, Faith. 
Hey, so my name is Cody Plant. I work with uh, Village Industrial Power or VIP for short. So VIP started off with our core product, which is the VIP 1040. It's a combined heat and power plant that uses agricultural waste as fuel. So it's fuel flexible. It's able to generate eight kilowatts of electrical energy, 10 kilowatts of shaft power, and the equivalent of 40 kilowatts of thermal energy, which is 60 kilograms of low pressure steam. So basically, once we had this fuel flexible solution, it was weather independent, it was fairly rugged, we had to explore the best ways to use the energy being generated. And this kind of led to our additional products in the form of productive use appliances, and the most popular one being our cabinet style fruit and vegetable dryer. And part of the problem we faced initially with having such a versatile core product was opportunity overload. So to combat this, we ended up concentrating our efforts with geographic focus and with the ancillary application products that we were offering to our customers. And our customers being rural smallholder farmers, we designed our offerings to provide this grid and wither independent solution to address the post-harvest loss issues through on-farm drying. And we ended up honing in initially on Makueni County in Kenya due to the volume of their mango production, as well as their issues with post-harvest losses. And we had to develop um, an extremely customer-centric business model. And what this resulted in for us was developing a framework which the customer felt comfortable enough to engage in financing of a new innovative technology. So our business model in a sense creates long-term partnerships with customers rather than just this initial sale. Uh, when we drilled into the core issue of post-harvest losses, we recognized the solution needed to run much deeper than simply access to financing of technology. So once the post-harvest processing has been completed, farmers have that value-added product but lack access to markets to absorb it at price points which make the model viable. They were understandably reluctant to adopt a new technology which proposed a half-baked solution to their problem. We ended up researching markets for dried fruits and landed in the U.S. market as the most viable option for us to provide market linkage. So we wanted to make a, find a market where the overall demand was high enough to absorb production at scale for future growth and the price point was high enough to justify the cost of the technology and the consumer segment also placed a value on fair trade practices and other social impact. Um, and we also had to be cognizant of the regulatory barriers that they not be insurmountable for a small technology startup to handle. So the central tenets of our business model are the fact that we're able to provide equipment on a lease to purchase basis, pay farmers a premium price for their dried fruit, and make regular payments upon delivery to our aggregation site so the farmers can replenish their work and capital and keep operating. So we had extensive and detailed negotiations with our initial customers to make them feel comfortable in accepting this risk. The business model is designed to create rural employment with up to 10 day labor jobs per plant. And we find that these mostly go to, to women. They're the most um, willing and adept at operating our equipment. Um, and uh, assuring market linkage stabilizes revenue for farmers. And we connect farmers to high value markets to pay premium prices for dried produce, increasing their profits. And we also reduce the fresh produce weight by 90% on farm. So subsequent CO2 emissions are therefore reduced by 90%. And it's worth noting we also have found segments of B2B customers that purchase our core product, the VIP 1040, as a standalone unit to provide electrification and hot water to worker compounds, improving access to energy and quality of life. The other form of drying we're exploring is a bin dryer, which has been developed, you know, so that's for grain drying, it's been developed to be powered at the farm level by our core product. Um, and we're in the process of testing this unit with one of our food entrepreneur customers. Um, grain drying as a service is priced in terms of percent drop in moisture content per unit of weight. So we're still exploring the viability of this option. And then finally, we've just developed a new product in the form of a low pressure boiler, which generates 100 kilograms of low pressure steam. So we saw an opportunity to diversify our offerings to customers, given that a certain segment of our target market have access to a reasonably reliable grid connection. So the benefit of the low pressure boiler is that it reduces the initial capital cost of the generation unit to customers by about 50%. And additionally, the, one of these low pressure boilers can power up to four cabinet dryers versus the VIP 1040, which can only do two. So, you know, the drawback of the option is that it is not grid independent and it supplies only the thermal energy component, but it's another option we're exploring. Thank you. Great. And uh, I'd like to introduce
Yeah, hi all. Um, my name is Lara and I'm the CEO of the Waste Transformers. And what we do as the Waste Transformers is we process organic waste on site. And we do that in an installation which is composed of 20 foot shipping containers. So it's essentially a uh, plug and play anaerobic digester that we've developed. Um, and we adjust the number of shipping containers based on the amount of waste that there is available. Um, and we process between 350 kilograms to around about 3,600 kilograms per day. For our first project, in, um, we were supported by um, EEP. That was in um, South Africa, where we put an installation at a shopping mall and we processed the uh, non-edible food waste from the shopping mall in our 20-foot shipping containers. We generated um, electricity on the one hand, from that, and, uh, from that food waste and that electricity was used directly to power the shopping mall and the residual heat that we uh, generated was used for hot water purposes at the, at the mall. Everything that remains from the process is a, um, a rich nutrient mix um, and that we used in order to, and, uh, on the one hand, to grow new food, and we also used it at a um, local golf course, thereby creating a truly circular solution about something that would otherwise be, uh, be thrown away. Um, for our next EEP project, which we really are very excited about, and um, that will take place in Uganda, and there we've moved much more towards positioning ourselves really at the nexus of food, energy, and water, so um, we can reconstruct, as it were, some of those agricultural value chains. Um, there, what we'll be doing is we'll be processing on site 3,000 kilograms of uh, agricultural and village organic waste. Um, the electricity that we generate will be used for a, um, a large irrigation system, which will be able to pump water to a number of different smallholders. Um, the heat that we generate would be an, um, that will be used and connected to some of the fish ponds, which are also part of the um, of the project. And the fish from those fish ponds will either be refrigerated or otherwise they will be uh, dried, ensuring that there's much less wastage from um, farm to fork. Um, and the nutrients that we generate will be used directly by the farmers on the land. Um, so. Once again, it's a fully circular solution that we offer, but this time to, uh, to smallholders. And we believe quite sincerely that if you want to change the world and you want to give it a nudge into a direction which is a little greener, a little cleaner, a little fairer, then and, um, just the technology itself is really not, a, not enough. So we've also developed an, uh, something new around our business model, and we call that our business in a box. And what we do with our business in a box is we enable entrepreneurs to run one of our installations as a business. So we provide them with the upfront contractual support that they need for both the waste takeoff agreement as well as for the you know, power purchase agreements that are needed. Um, and we support them along the way. We have developed a software interface um, so we can follow our installations 24 seven online. We know exactly what they're doing and how they're performing. Um, and we can provide them all the support that they need to be as successful as possible um, whilst keeping their own neighborhoods clean. It's essentially a uh, lease to own construct so that an, um, once the installation is actually paid off, then ownership is uh, transferred to the local entrepreneur. And in, in uh, Uganda, for the, the other project that we've, um, that we've just started, there we've structured it a little bit differently. So there we're working with a local company, Skyfox, and essentially what we do is an, um, the whole infrastructure is funded by a combination of an, um, the EEP funding and of uh, Skyfox, and essentially by increasing the yields of all the smallholders, we are able to take a, um, a percentage of the increased yield and we use that as a basis in order to pay back our original and um, our original investments. We're active um, in Europe, we are active in South Africa, we have a project and, um, in Sierra Leone, we're starting in um, Uganda, we've also just started a project in uh, Ghana um, and interesting enough what we see in this COVID period is that an, um, a lot of other markets have really opened up for us and one of them is um, is in the Middle East, which I'll say a little bit more about later. Thank you so much.
Um, as you've heard, we have a really exciting range of uh, technologies and business models that we can learn from today in AG and in uh, the circular economy sectors. So we'll have another session after this to just dig a little deeper into challenges and successes and more lessons from the field. Um, for now, we please send your questions in the chat box. We will keep those coming and we will have them ready for our speakers at the very end uh, of this webinar. Okay, so um, now it's time to take a break from the discussion for a, for a moment and engage the audience. Uh, you see a question on the screen related to the topic that um, certainly concerns all the five companies and, and, and that I already touched in my introduction. So uh, whether you're a professional in productive use of energy or just uh, um, here to uh, curious and here to learn more, just take a few seconds to reflect this and submit your response. So uh, what is the most critical bottleneck in market access for productive use of energy appliances? Uh, is it the high upfront costs or lack of financing? lack of market data to find the right customer segments, or difficulty in marketing and reaching customers, uh, low customer awareness of the product benefits, uh, or lack of technical skills among customers. Okay, so here we have the results. Uh, we got a very good percentage of responses. Um, so the audience uh, clearly agrees that um, high upfront costs and, and lack of financing is the most critical bottleneck. Um, so I will now hand it back to Faith, who can continue with the next questions and um, and also let the, the panelists. Uh, uh, elaborate on this topic if they feel like doing it. So please go ahead. Okay. Sorry, Faith. We I'm afraid we cannot really hear you. Let's try that again. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Sorry about that. So, yeah, thank you. And, uh, just now, we did into this factor that he did the article for production plans. We'll start with uh, Laura from Kwame. Laura, could you please share with us from um, Okay, I'm sorry, Faith. Um, uh, we cannot hear you clearly. It's breaking up. But um, well, at least we we have the question now here uh, on the screen. You can maybe try to repeat, or then Laura can can go ahead and, and answer the question. All right. Okay. So yeah. Sure. Um, thank you, Faith and and Lotta. So. Faith, it was a little bit hard to hear you, but you shared the question ahead of time. So um, I've been asked to speak around how expanding access to finance can drive uptake and how that in turn impacts us as a company. And um, so I'll speak a little bit about, you know, PowerMe's approach to introducing these productive use appliances um, and how we intend to do that in a way that mitigates the risk both for the customers and for us. And so for solar home systems, obviously pay-as-you-go has been 
uh, a very popular financing model. It's emerged over the last 10 years and it has played an important role in making products more affordable to people who would otherwise struggle to be able to access solar home systems. And pay as you go, for those who aren't familiar, is quite simple. Basically, the customer pays a down payment at the beginning and then daily or weekly payments, depending on the company, uh, until the product is paid for in full. And remote monitoring technology makes it possible for the company to turn off the, the product, even from a distance, if they don't get the, the um, daily or weekly payment from the customer. And so when we looked at PowerMe at introducing new products into our uh, portfolio, we of course thought about how does that tie into the solar home system itself. And so for our customers, they're largely earning sort of less than $3 a day. They don't have a lot of disposable income and we have to be very responsible about not placing them with too much of a burden in making their payments. And so one of the things when we create the customer pool for our Power to the Shabamalas program, we need to look at customers who have a livelihood that they've told us about and that they've demonstrated in their payment pattern for their solar home system. And then we can choose to market these higher value productive use products to only those customers who seem to be able to pay them back over time. And of course, with productive use, um, the one of the main benefits compared to a solar home system is that it's easier to derive additional income from using a productive use appliance. That's why they're called productive use in the end. And so the customer will also be able to make more money from the product and therefore their capacity to repay will also improve. So where we, when we enable the pay-as-you-go um, approach on productive use appliances, then we get the same benefits as with solar home systems. Um, and with because we've already sold the solar home systems before, we have that extra risk mitigation element there as well. Um, now, in terms of um, how does that in increase uptake? Well, it's it's quite transformative because most of our customers wouldn't be able to make that lump sum payment. And then in terms of increasing the financial viability of solar home system companies. So PowerMe, because we're, we're a second generation company and we came into the market a little bit later, we didn't have sort of high grant or equity funding at the beginning of our journey anyway. And we focused really on uh, financial sustainability from the start. And before COVID and the impacts of COVID, we actually reached bottom line profitability at the beginning of this year. And we think it is important to be able to demonstrate financial sustainability with your core business. That being said, um, increasing our product portfolio and the diversity in our product portfolio makes it possible for us to have more follow on sales to our customers. So right now with only solar home systems, we can provide solar home systems and then larger solar home systems but not all customers will want to go into larger solar home systems. With the, with the support of EEP, we're introducing a whole range of new products. So going from rain, rainwater harvesting tanks, which are very um, popular and in high demand among our customers, we're going to introduce larger, even larger solar home systems that are easier to use in a business setting, such as in a small restaurant or kiosk or hotel. We're introducing solar water pumping, which will help uh, with small scale farming. And we're also introducing solar powered refrigerators, which can again help in hospitality settings uh, for cooling drinks, especially, and can also help reduce food waste and improve productivity and income from, from agricultural produce. So, so with those uh, additional revenue, additional products, we can, give more products and services to our existing customers. We can also reach more customers in the areas that we operate. So that increases our customer lifetime value um, and it increases the, 
the sort of longevity of, of the relationship that we have with our customers beyond the solar home system. Um, the other thing that higher value products typically have is also higher margins. Um, so that, of course, uh, helps us with our bottom line. And finally, one thing that I want to point out with the, the benefit of introducing new products is that it gives additional livelihoods to also our employees and our sales agents and uh, technicians. So in our areas where we have an area sales manager and a shop coordinator, they will have additional um, sort of scope to, to increase their, their output and increase their bonuses. And then for our technicians and sales agents, it gives them something else to sell, um, which helps them to, to get more uh, out of the time that they invest in, in self-empowering products. Um, one thing to, that I wanted to note here, uh, as I know we have a diverse audience, including donors and investors, is that it is not, um, it's not straightforward for a solar home system company to introduce new products into their portfolio. And it really requires also additional working capital because these are higher uh, value products. They cost more than a solar home system would. And so we need our debt providers, our inventory financing providers to also work with us um, to build new uh, financing products for productive use products. Um, we're confident though that even though it's not a simple journey, we have we have the right partners in place uh, with EEP, uh, with our suppliers, also our new suppliers in the productive use arena, um, and with our debt and equity providers to, to get these products going. Um, and I'm sure that that will then over time increase both the the revenues for our customers and help them increase their livelihoods, as well as um, improve the revenues of, of Palomi as a company. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laura. I'll now move on to Sharon. And uh, Sharon will talk about partnerships. And considering that most solar home system companies are virtually integrated, already doing a lot uh, across the value chain, between finding the right technology, distributing it, training, doing the financing, there's a real need for partnerships to be able to deliver on productive these appliances. And I uh, just want to hear from Power Life's experience, what partnerships have you forged along the way and how do you see that playing a part in productive user plans delivery uh, overall? Thank you, Faith. Uh, the issue of partnership plays a significant role to play. Sorry, the issue of partnership plays a significant role. If we were to say the issue of uh, productive use, if we want it to be a success, microfinance institutions come in and play their part in, te in terms of asset finance. Well, in a case where a customer buys an irrigation system or a solar water pump, and then it's damaged or it gets stolen, there is need for these partners to come in and replace this, this product. In our case, we have insurance which covers that. And then um, product, productive energy, generally, productive energy assets are of high value. And the issue of upfront capital commitment is critical. And I think this really needs addressing. And now with our suppliers, we have managed to forge uh, partnerships with a number of suppliers, and that includes SolarWorks, we've got Grenade Planet, we've got Angaza. And I, I should say that we've got a really great relationship going on. But there is need for serious partnerships between last mile distributors and manufacturers, especially in terms of products and market needs. Most of the productive use appliances are expensive, like I've mentioned before, generally. And depending on the target market, it's wise that the products are offered on different stages in relation to the farmer's income. In our case, we have uh, we offer solar oats products which uh, is scalable, like I've mentioned earlier on. Now, how this works is um, 
depending on the income that the farmer has, they usually start with an entry level product. We'll say in a case of uh, a poultry farmer, they can initially just buy a system that comes with the lights. And then when production increases and they feel that they need to have more fall runs and probably a solar water pump to come with the system, all they need to do is to add the solar ego and then it simply increases the power for the appliances that they would have added. So we feel this is very convenient for our customers because we work with them in all the stages of the, of income generating. And then we also, like I've mentioned earlier on, that we have a good relationship with Angaza, the pay-as-you-go partners. It's important to have partners and software to enhance digital skills and internet connectivity for small cell farmers. It is through this internet connectivity that we that the farmers will know more about the appliances they they're using and that they can also maximize from the products that they would have bought. And also, I want to add on that during this time of COVID-19, where virtual connectivity is being encouraged, it will be a good thing for our small-scale farmers to also learn about this because they also need to know that despite what's going on around the world, work doesn't have to stop. They can still do their work, but just in a different way than they were used to before. Now, our business model is a pay-as-you-go model, and it entitles progressive payments for our customers, which is a very good thing, but it also requires a lot of capital. So it means other options like debt financing would be difficult for startups like us. So we urge those impact investor institutions and any other institutions which have patient capital or grants to come on board and help us. Thank you, Faith. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll now move to Priscilla. And uh, Priscilla, you already touched on the raising of awareness to facilitate adoption of especially irrigation among other technologies that require behavior change. So I kindly ask you to stick to three minutes to just uh, talk a bit about the need to raise awareness with either highly innovative technology, that's technology that has not been proven yet. And in the case of solar irrigation, like what lessons are you learning there that other players can uh, learn from in their space? Are you mute? You can't unmute yourself? No? Okay. Maybe we can go to, to Cody first and then our team it's, will um, it's unmuted now. I'm good now. Okay. It's unmuted now. I, I had I had muted myself and an organizer, so I couldn't do it on this side. Um okay. so just in terms of raising awareness. So I mentioned um, in passing that the pharma groups, the pharma clubs that we have been engaging with, um, I suppose it's been lucky to, to some extent that they're already aware of irrigation um, technology and, and solar uh, because even though they do not have solar pumps, they, they have had access or they have seen um, solar home systems or other other forms of solar um, in their communities. So it's been a low hanging fruit um, in that sense. And they're also already engaged in irrigation in some form or other um, that they, even if it's watering using a, a bucket of season, they are aware of what it means to not rely just on rain. But on our side, then how we're doing that, um, how we're trying to raise awareness for the technology that we have specifically, has been through direct engagement. So the, the pharma groups and the pharma clubs that the shortlisting that we got from our partners, we have engaged quite a couple of them. We have gone to the field, um, talked to them about the equipment that we have, presented the, the benefits of it, presented um, the positives of it and how it would increase their income, but most importantly, how we support them throughout that, that process. Um, and the, the features that are very, uh, 
very appealing to our customers are the fact that first of all it is solar technology so it is off grid and because most of them are not connected to the grid um, this is a big plus because otherwise they they would not be able to use it um, and also the traditionally the uh, pumps that have been sold to off-grid communities would be diesel powered but then if it's a solar pump then they don't necessarily have to worry about generating the income to continue to buy the diesel and to operate it so that reduces the operational cost the the upfront cost is high but then we help them with that in terms of the access to the funding and the loan that the, they would get from our finance partners so the cost is lower um, and also because of the the fact that we're targeting smallholder farmers what we're bringing in is technology that is plug and play and it is mobile so that reduces the risk of theft it reduces the 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 risk of that you put it in the field and somebody else maybe comes and takes a panel off or takes the pump itself so they're foldable panels uh with a pump that the farmer can take to the field in the morning and then take back home in the evening so all of these features uh, are very, very appealing. So we have directly engaged the farmers through sessions, uh, information sessions. We have flyers, we have videos that um, we have used to, to engage the farmers. And in terms of how to use the technology itself and the trainings that we uh, we're talking about, we we have uh, a, a local partner, uh, GIZ um, Malawi. That we have partnered with because they have they do quite a lot of work in terms of good agricultural practice trainings and farmer business schools and these are trainings that uh, GIZ has done all over the world all over all over the continent so we thought that that would be better than us trying to develop our own training and then starting from scratch so the partner GIZ has then trained our staff so a TOT of us and then through that we are able to deliver a training that is certified that um, is world standard we do not have to start from scratch and it's, it's very high quality um, um, training as well and the, we're continuously engaging the farmers um, like I said throughout the season uh, every month at least minimum going to them talking to them making sure that they're actually using the equipment as they're supposed to um, and helping them throughout the process so that they're not they're not making losses and they're not spoiling the equipment or breaking the equipment so in terms of raising awareness specifically um i will reiterate that we have been we have been lucky in that and it, you'd be surprised how aware people are of options that they have they just do not know where to get them so once you bring that technology to them they are already open because in our case they have been looking for it so we we've had people because our for instance our first batch of equipment was delayed because of covid we had so many people that were waiting for us to say we want this equipment um, where is it where is it we've been looking for solar irrigation but we didn't know where to get it so the awareness raising is there but then it's simply just now a matter of boosting it specifically in relation to the equipment that we are selling and how we support the farmers and how we stand out from um, our market competitors. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Priscilla. Our Cody Village Industrial Power, as you touched on and uh, just mentioned, VIP has developed a very innovative, great technology. I've seen it myself in, in Kenya, and it's been quite a journey trying to figure out the different applications from pasteurizing to hub drying to mango drying and just really developing those markets for your technology. Uh, yeah, I would like to just learn from you some of the lessons you have learned along the way of uh, developing markets for this highly innovative technology. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, so you're right. You know, we definitely did face a variety of issues dealing with um, the early stages of technology adoption, right? So we're targeting innovators and early adopters. So about two and a half percent of people are innovators. Very difficult to find, but they're crucial to our business model. And we capture a small portion of the early adopters as well, but you know they require more risk mitigation and assurance before they commit. So we initially capture an interest um, for a, a really small part of the smallholder farmer segment because they had to meet our capital requirements, fit our geographic profile, be willing to accept the risks of our proposal. Um, so you know we were really had to be customer centric in our approach and and nail down all the details of these agreements. And, and what we found is that we rely on our, our reputation and our relationships to facilitate this. And of course, we have to have clearly defined roles and responsibilities in our contracts. So, you know, at that point, you know, we have this innovative product and we have a strong case for how it can be applied and useful in Kenya. But our question was, you know, how do we 
track down these 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 early innovators. Um, so we knew who our target market was, who it could provide a benefit to, but just showing our, our prospective customers a cost benefit analysis just obviously wasn't going to cut it for, for getting them to, to come on board. So one component we had initially, which was really necessary to our success with this project, was we had an existing installation for the same application where our prospective customers could make arrangements to, to view it in action, see it working, and speak with the owner who is a fellow farmer appear that they could um, you know rely more on than what we were saying uh, so like one, one thing we heard often was you know they need to make sure we weren't building castles in the sky was a term they used um, so the process for us was basically threefold convince customers of the overall concept convince customers of the functionality reliability of the technology and assure customers of our commitment to them beyond the sale of the technology um, so the people we prospected were you know naturally intuitive sharp people so they understood the inherent value of their produce and recognized the need to address post-harvest losses we discovered quickly you know they didn't have um, access to markets for the dried produce and there's only so much you can segment an already tiny target market so we decided that in order for this to work we had to assure the market linkage so after we made that decision we logically thought okay let's identify off takers the closest point of production as possible in the value chain so we wanted to continue our focus mainly as technology company. So we started looking at this, but we found the, the price points weren't viable. Oftentimes it barely covered the operational expenses for the farm, let alone amortization of the technology or any consideration for the fresh fruit price. So we moved into the informal sector in Kenya through the street hawker networks. And we found really that they, um, they weren't able to take that risk. They weren't able to, to use an unproven product because they relied on sales to customers daily for sustenance, so you couldn't even compensate with margin. So they wanted to sell something that was well known to their customers. And then we also took a look at um, the domestic market in Kenya, which has competing brands and it has a certain amount of volume, but it really wasn't ideal for our long-term goals. So that's why we ended up landing on the US market as our best option to absorb future production at large volumes for a variety of, of dried crops. Uh, and we learned a significant amount about meeting regulatory requirements for, for um, able, you know, being able to access these markets. You know, so, so you have to ensure food safety of the products from the point of production all the way to the consumer. I mean, this wasn't how we sought out to direct this project, but the lesson learned in terms of various market capacities, price points, and regulatory requirements strengthened our, our entire company. So we were able to speak with authority when dealing with customers, improve the technology, and develop new packaging mechanisms to optimize deployment of supply infrastructure. So what this means is that by redesigning a drying plant to meet food safety standards while being packaged within a 40-foot shipping container, we were able to retain the same functionality and price point to our customers, but eliminate many of the regulatory barriers through use of a semi-permanent structure. So the other aspect of this, this planted many seeds for future collaborations and further innovation to our on-farm productive use appliances. So we're looking now at you know, what this can be one year, two years, three years from now, and there's just so much room for improvement. So that's the fun part of what we do, getting to you know, unearth new problems and design new solutions. So the best advice we can give for anyone looking to bring innovative productive use appliance to market or develop a new market for your product is be customer centric from the start. A lot of time and resources can be saved by asking the right people the right questions. Challenges, of course, knowing who to ask, when to ask it beforehand. In our case, the initial plan to address post harvest losses through on farm dryers unearthed a multitude of sub level challenges. This is to be expected. We like to keep the bigger picture in mind and view the situation through the lens of innovators and early adopters who are not easy to find and are crucial to gaining traction for your technology in new markets. I think if you're introducing a technology that is foreign to its users, you have to be strategic about it. People tend to follow trends rather predictably. So if the model is sound, then you can be successful as long as you're able to facilitate a successful first iteration. And we have already seen a significant spike in interest as our project materializes. So now we're no longer having to prospect. We just focus on the successful implementation of V1 and word spreading and the leads are coming to us. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Cody. I uh, will now go to Lara, and you already touched on uh, COVID-19, and uh, mm -hmm. great to hear for you that that is actually opening opportunities. So actually, my question to you is, West Transformers is operating in several markets, so in Europe, South Africa, West Africa, East Africa, and operating in the last month through COVID. 
And now just curious as a venture with global operations, what some of the lessons have been that you've learned in innovative ways that your business is navigating the impacts of COVID, especially being in the circular economy where you actually would put stuff. So I, I, I must say, I mean, the the you know, COVID has pretty much changed the world, right? It's and uh, the impact of it has been absolutely huge. Um, what we do see is that globally there are really substantial differences in terms of uh, in terms of that impact. But I know for ourselves, our offices are based in the Netherlands, um, and March 13 was really a very big day for us. I mean, we saw literally in the period of one week our entire global project pipeline just dry up. Um, it was absolutely devastating. I mean, I, I really, it was and not being able to sleep at night, working out in sweats, thinking, how are we going to do this, for goodness sake? How are we going to cope? You know, how are we going to, how are we going to uh, figure this out and figure out a way to, uh, to, to move forward and to move beyond it? We do have one huge advantage, and that is that we can really control our installations online. That means that we have an, uh, we really have good sight online on uh, what they're doing and how they're working. Um, but slowly but surely, we started to see totally other problems starting to appear. So, for example, in, um, at our installation in um, South Africa, um, in the shopping mall, um, people were suddenly not going to shopping malls anymore. So there was essentially no food waste available. Um, what we also saw increasingly was that the shopping malls were having huge challenges because um, tenants increasingly just couldn't pay their rent. So the, and, uh, the rates were becoming, uh, the occupancy rates were and, uh, dropping quite, quite substantially. Um, and that for us and, uh, really was a, was a market that we saw, I mean, essentially we saw, we saw drying up in a very short space of time. So because we have mobile installations, um, our tactic there was we let's literally take up these containers and we can place them somewhere else, and um, which is exactly what we did. So we were able to take it to different contexts and demonstrate the technology in different contexts, um, which has really been incredibly valuable for us. And we were able to link that to a bit of an innovation on our side in order to uh, link it directly and much more directly to growing uh, fresh food. Um, and that's a, a step that we made and actually we found that incredibly valuable for us. And, um, and it's certainly something that we're going to uh, pursue even more. Um, on the other hand, we're also active in, a, in, in Sierra Leone. In Sierra Leone, we power a local woman's hospital based on the organic waste from the neighborhood. Um, there was a lockdown for a couple of weeks in Sierra Leone, um, and after that, we found that the impact was actually in, uh, much less, much less strong than it when then we experienced it in um, in other countries. Um, the other thing that happened there was in, uh, sanitation, which has always been a key challenge in the country. Uh, it's a country which has gone through a devastating Ebola outbreak. Um, and when COVID came along, the, the awareness around kind of alternative sanitation needs was really incredibly heightened. So we found that suddenly we were being approached by people that who, who weren't knocking on the door before because they really saw the value of having a approach which tackles both an energy issue as well as a jobs issue, as well as a sanitation issue. Um, so that really opened up a whole lot of new uh, opportunities for us. And then with corporate clients, and um, what we found really interesting, they're, they're pretty much split in two. So you had one group of corporate clients where suddenly everything stopped, locked down, absolutely no movement at all, nothing happening, all innovation projects were put on hold. Um, and we had another group of, uh, of corporates who were much more thinking about in uh, kind of their long-term strategy and using the time to, to sort of sit back and reflect on their strategy and to reflect much more strongly about, an, um, about where they're going. And actually with that group of clients, we've seen an, uh, really a, a huge uh, growth in our, corporate, uh, in our corporate base, which has been incredibly enlightening for us because you know, there it's an, uh, for us a, a key challenge is really to the, the cost of sale, which can be rather high. So if we have a client in which we have already built in all those multipliers and we're able to do the same thing with that same client on multiple locations, um, that increases our impact enormously. 
Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention was, you know, in that area, in that time period where it was like deep panic, how are we going to do this? And um, we really looked around to see if we could um, um, get involved with a, with a completely different kind of an, uh, client base. And we reached out to project developers specifically for new housing projects. Um, because these are typically in uh, areas which have a, a, a much longer um, development timeline. Um, and there we were managed to gain a number of uh, new projects um, with project developers, where we will actually place the installation at the uh, at local community level. Um, and we will be able to process the organic waste from that community on site um, using also the, uh, the business in a box. So kind of also thinking about it on the in the long term, not just kind of uh, on the short term panic, also really helped us to uh, to ride the wave. Brilliant, brilliant, quite a success story. We'll be sure to capture that and <laughs> your just your success through the season. So thanks so much for sharing, and thank you to all our panelists for the brilliant contribution and for sharing your business models and your lessons generously. So. I'll now hand the session over to my colleague, Lota, to take us through the last poll and a few questions. Uh, we still have about, yeah, we still have some time to go. Lota, over to you. Okay, thank you, Faith. Thank you, uh, panelists. So now it's time for our uh, final poll. Um, so where do you see the, the biggest growth in demand for productive use of energy appliances in Africa? Is it in, in post-harvest agro-processing, uh, milling, grinding, uh, et cetera, or in food conservation, drying, um, or cold storage, uh, milk chilling, ice production for fish, uh, uh, or then irrigation, or information, communication services, or e-mobility? Um, I'll give you uh, a minute to, to uh, reflect on this and, and then uh, submit your response. And then we will see if we have any questions coming from the audience. Now it looks like uh, we don't have any. Um, I, I actually hope that next year uh, it will be possible to arrange a real in-person knowledge exchange forum uh, event again and, and also get engaged in more informal networking after the panel discussions it's um, often the fun part in these events. Uh, okay, so the results from the final poll. Uh, let's see, uh, irrigation is number one um, according to, to our audience and next coming post-harvest agro-processing. Uh, okay, so this is something for, for everybody to um to uh take away with uh from from this um from this session so now it, it really seems that we're not uh getting any questions from the audience so i will um thank our panelists for joining we're very excited to to continue collaboration with you and uh and we're looking forward to seeing uh uh, future results from Pawame, Walla, VIP, Waste Transformers and Power Live. Um, as well as from the other projects working with uh, productive use of energy. Um, tomorrow is the closing session of EP Africa Knowledge Week, uh, where we will hear a donor representative, um, the Finnish uh, ambassador for climate change, talking about the achievements of EP Africa in the past 10 years. And um, as we are excitedly also looking ahead to the next 10 years, um, and as you may know, EP Africa has launched a new Rising Energy Leaders Award uh, to recognize the next generation of innovators in the clean energy space. And I will um, present you the, the five rising energy leaders who have demonstrated a strong commitment to advancing clean energy solutions. And they have uh, demonstrated professional growth achievement in the sector and of course uh, ambitious goals for the future. Uh, so the 2020 winners will join us tomorrow for a roundtable discussion on emerging trends and opportunities in, in the sector. And then um, 
The other highlight of tomorrow's session is, of course, the awarding of EDP Project of the Year. So these five shortlisted, shortlisted finalists, um, JAZA, Gigawatt Global, Tiny Totos, uh, Yellow, and Sunful Energy, um, they have all made outstanding achievement in 2020, and they will present their projects uh, before an international pan panel of uh, ju judges. Um, from NDF, uh, EACRI, IKEA Foundation, and African Guarantee Fund. I mean, uh, there will be no, no discussion tomorrow, but we will uh, award the finalists. Uh, award the, the project of the year, I mean. So uh, please uh, go on and register for the for the final session and, and join our um, uh, our highlight of the knowledge week. And just before we uh, we wrap up, uh, since I see no questions coming in, uh, just take a look at the handouts if you haven't done it yet, uh, and you will of course uh, be able to access them in our on our website. And you will receive the recording of this webinar uh, in about an hour, uh, and also very short feedback from forum. Uh, and we of course hope that you will fill out the, the feedback. Uh, thank you again to the to the speakers, and thank you to the audience for participating in this webinar. And um, have a good rest of the day.